for the Entrepreneur's podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. Today, we have John Holmquist on the show. John is the head of marketing at GoCoin and GoPayWin.com. He founded Bitcoin Black Friday and worked with Roger Veyer on the Bitcoin store. We talk about Bitcoin merchant and consumer adoption, how the adult industry is taking Bitcoin for a test drive, and John's tips for how to find good, passionate programmers to work with you on your idea. Your host today is Justin Blinko. If you like this episode, please join us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast or Facebook.com slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes, links, and our other episodes are found at LibertyEntrepreneurs.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome, John. So how did you get into entrepreneurship in the first place? Actually, I think sort of the the beginning started with my father. He's a small business owner, so he's always been basically working for himself, doing various things. Uh, he mainly works in telecom uh, and political consulting, but mainly mainly the telecom. It, it's, it's a little confusing about what he does because he, he works <laughs> in a lot of different industries. Um, so I've always looked up to him uh, because of that. And then past that, I got involved on the internet from a very early age, played a lot of video games as a kid, uh, a lot of online multiplayer games, and uh, that sort of introduced me into the world of working online. I somehow got uh, sort of entrenched into uh, an affiliate marketing community, and that's where I actually started getting my first paychecks uh, straight from the internet. So uh, this was back when I was just entering high school, uh, a very young kid. Um, and the interesting thing is I actually did apply for you know minimum wage entry level uh, positions with a bunch of different companies and you know brick and mortar stores and all over the place. And I actually didn't get any of those positions, um, but I was still able to make money online. Um, so uh, that just kind of started, sparked the fire. I've been working online ever since. And how did you find Bitcoin? So my older brother works for Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so he's a giant freaking nerd. And... Uh, <laughs> He, he has a, a developer background, and he told me about Bitcoin when he found it, introduced me to it, and I really didn't give it much mind. I was about 18 at the time, and uh, the closest casino where I could play poker was about an hour and a half's drive away from me, and I had a little bit of a poker habit back then. I spent a lot of time playing poker, and I wanted to, you know, practice practice playing poker, but there were no sites to play poker online uh, in the U.S. So uh, I put the two pieces together and found a, a Bitcoin poker site where I could play on and uh, actually got my first Bitcoin just by doing free rolls on that poker site and basically working my way up. Just Making poker money talent. out of nothing. Yep, and it only took, you know, I don't know, three weeks of 23 hour days of playing poker nonstop. <laughs> Sounds healthy. Mm hmm. It was extremely healthy. Uh, wasted a summer doing that, but it was great. Um, I love poker. But uh, that's just sort of how I got introduced uh, to Bitcoin is just through, through the gambling scene. Um, and uh, I started getting more involved with it because uh, I was using it and I saw that it had potential to actually be something powerful, especially in the United States a tool to empower people who couldn't access something who now could. In, in my case, poker. Eventually, you, as we saw with the Bitcoin rise, it uh, also became a tool for people to use drugs or to buy drugs on the black market uh, with the Silk Road. But uh, did not predict that one coming. Yeah, a lot of people that if you first introduce Bitcoin to someone and especially someone in the US, they kind of say, well, what would I use that for? the first thing that you got into gambling, you know, one of the vices is something that seems to pop up uh, occasionally. And then also buying illegal substances where an online market wouldn't work in with any other payment methods. In any conventional sense, unless you're using some really sketchy Russian payment site. <laughs> yeah. That, I, mean, I'm sure I like to avoid. <laughs> so what's interesting though, is that uh, I'm focusing sort of on the third vice uh, with GoCoin right now, and that's the adult industry, because uh, that's another area where it's very difficult to basically accept or take payments uh, on the internet. How uh, warmly are they embracing Bitcoin? Do they see it as solving problems or what's their viewpoint, if you can generalize? 
so that's the one segment of merchants that GoCoin has seen growth in month over month. That is the only segment of merchants where we've actually seen a growth in Bitcoin volume. But the downside is that there still aren't enough Bitcoin consumers who are spending their Bitcoins on, a, on the adult industry. Um, that's going to be one of sort of my bigger projects in the next couple months is trying to convince Bitcoin consumers to come together, work together, and uh, start spending their coins on adult websites. So or the, pull in some, uh, some adult website users to start using Bitcoin instead of paying with credit card. Yeah, so the, the merchant, they feel the pain of the current system that they're using, the current payment solutions. Uh, but their customers don't necessarily feel that pain. So they're, why, why would they change if they get the benefit of points back, you know, chargebacks, all, all the other benefits that credit cards come with that, you know, the first one that I can think of is the privacy of the transaction. Yes. Uh, so everyone who's trying to convert a Bitcoin or a merchant into Bitcoin knows sort of the, the general pitches that you give. Uh, it's secure. There are no chargebacks for the merchant. Uh, it's private for the consumer, and then there are very little fees. But for your general merchant, those just aren't issues. It's very easy to accept credit cards online. But in the adult industry, unless you're an established player, your credit card acceptance fees are going to be sky high. Uh, it's actually pretty ridiculous how high they can get. Can you tell Not us what, mention, what ranges are for? The lowest I've seen is uh, probably around maybe 0.5%, closer to 1.5%. And then the highest I've seen is goes up to like 22% or something insane like that. Wow, that's, yeah, it goes up pretty pretty high fast. If you're doing really high risk transactions, um, they can basically charge whatever they want to charge. Right. And the other side of that too is sometimes to set up a payment account. Uh, if you're a new business in the adult industry, you have to do monthly payments of a fixed amount, or you have to do a, an account setup fee, or all this other uh, sort of limiting things. Um, so right, that, that's, monthly recurring and, and different business models that they've been relying on because of credit cards. Yes, and you, fraud mainly, and yeah, it's uh, yeah. the credit card processors just don't like the adult industry. <laughs> um, <laughs> For uh, obvious reasons, but it's it's something that Bitcoin can help fix, uh, and that's that's something that we're going to try and focus on. Let's go back to when you first started getting into Bitcoin and, and Coinable. What what was uh, selling gold for Bitcoin like? Uh, was that 2013? What was the time frame there? Yeah, it was uh, 2013. I left Coinable because I didn't uh, enjoy. Uh, the service that we ended up providing. Um, we, we started having fulfillment issues and uh, I, I had a disagreement with the CEO about how we would handle those fulfillment issues. Um, so uh, I left so that my name wouldn't be tarnished and they had a class action lawsuit filed against them because of it. So I think that was generally a good idea. But um, I was a freshman in college, uh, fresh off the boat, um, so to speak, and uh, I was I was working in the Bitcoin space mainly just trying to advocate for Bitcoin, uh, trying to get more people using it, trying to advertise the, the benefits of Bitcoin. Um, and I met Jay, who is the CEO of Coinable, in an IRC channel, um, and he was telling me about a project he was working on to start selling gold that he bought from a wholesale supplier to people for Bitcoin. And I thought that was a pretty good idea because uh, the online retailers for gold actually have a pretty high uh, cost if you're trying to buy with a credit card. They, they actually give you a reduction if you send in a bank wire instead of trying to buy with a credit card or a debit card. Um, yeah. So I thought that was a, a space where you could potentially lower the fees and, and uh, allow more online transactions and volumes to actually occur. Um, what ended up happening is Coinable was one of the few gold exchangers uh, out there that was actually doing uh, a high amount of volume to the point where people were using it to cash out of Bitcoin instead of using Mt. Gox. So it also became a way for people to uh, sort of submit their Bitcoin at that price and, and cash out and not have to deal with uh, the less than reliable exchanges that existed back then. 
I don't remember the exact stats, but from 2013, one of the biggest retail uses of Bitcoin was precious metals and Coinable and Amagi Metals and a couple other guys made up a big portion of all Bitcoin transactions that weren't just, you know, trading. And Yeah, it was it was incredibly insane to within our first year of launching that site, uh, see over a million dollars in volume. Um, that That's huge for any online merchant. Yeah. Uh, so it was it was that. Basically, my first real startup. I made another startup with a guy I met on Twitter uh, when I was 15, trying to sell VPSs that lasted about a week and a half before I realized that we were selling them for more than we were buying them from the supplier for. So we we ended up having to shut that one down due to loss of funds for obvious reasons. Um, you couldn't just make it up in volume. Nope. <laughs> well, it's. Uh, I, I was looking at what our competitors were charging, so I, I charged less than them, and then I figured out why they were charging that that much. <laughs> well, at least it didn't take you too long to figure that out. <laughs> mm-hmm. That so, was that was a good first lesson. But uh, Coinable was was basically my my first real startup that I worked on, um, and after that, I uh, I actually started Bitcoin Black Friday while I was working for Coinable because uh, I was constantly trying to come up with ways to, to push people to, to actually buy more with their Bitcoins. And that Bitcoin Black, Black Friday became a pretty big event, did it not? Uh, and it's still the is. Single, single biggest day of Bitcoin shopping every year. Um, it, was, it was incredibly huge in 2013 when we had that huge price boost and everyone in the press was excited about Bitcoin. Um, at this point, though, I think this year the event will still be pretty big, but I don't think it will be anywhere near the mania that it was in 2013. Yeah, it depends on the price, if it's going up or down, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to see. Um, Bitcoin's been kind of a crazy ride. Definitely. And then the Bitcoin store. You worked with Roger and helped one of the pioneering yes. websites in saying, hey... You can accept Bitcoin for just about any good out there, and it's economically viable. The big issue was everyone would always say, but what can you actually buy with Bitcoin? Nowadays, it's pretty easy because you can literally buy anything that you want. You can buy airplane tickets. You can buy movie tickets. You can just any type of electronics. But, I mean, in the early days, you were limited in the merchants that you could accept or you could go to. Um, So Bitcoin Store was an idea that Roger had by working with one of the... uh, top industry uh, drop shippers. Drop shipping is, is essentially working with another company who actually ships out the, the goods and warehouses the goods that you're trying to sell. Um, I believe Bitcoin Store worked with Ingram Micro, which is pretty sure it's the lar- largest drop shipper in America. Um, and basically the goal that Roger set out with was to make Bitcoin Store so successful that it would run itself out of business. Um, <laughs> Which is a very weird business model, and honestly, it was it was a lot of fun working working with uh, the the team behind Bitcoin Store. I, I had a lot of fun with it. We got and you guys succeeded in your goal of running yourself out of business. Was there like a yes. particular metric, or how, how did you decide? Uh, all right, pat yourself on the back. We're out of jobs. So the goal was to get Amazon to accept Bitcoin, which they to this day have not. Um, and Mind you, I have every single trade show I go to, if I ever see anyone from Amazon Payments there or anyone tangentially related to Amazon, I will go and just talk their ear off about Bitcoin. Um, but Do you have any insight don't. into why what, what their reluctance is? Back a while ago, they tried to make their own sort of, uh, not currency, but sort of cash redeem system, mainly for their uh, app store, but... I, it was it was on I think it was like Amazon Coin or something. It's been a while since I've looked it up. Yeah, Amazon Coins are a digital currency uh, for apps and games. And it, I, I assume that they didn't want to get involved in Bitcoins because they wanted to uh, sort of promote their own little digital currency. Um, right. But so it never. With really their own tablets and off. their own cell phones and different things that they've tried to. And we all know how that has gone. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I I tried the Amazon Fire for a little bit, but it's just so restrictive what apps you can actually download that it it drove me insane. Yeah, it seems like they 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 like the closed garden, uh, everything going through them, their platform, yeah. which works for a lot of things they've done and they've they've obviously accomplished a lot very successfully. But at the same time, uh, I don't think they're going to accept Bitcoin uh, at this point 
or any point in the relatively near future. There simply aren't enough Bitcoin consumers out there spending Bitcoins for any major merchant to uh, sort of reasonably look at Bitcoin anymore. Um, and with Purse.io, unless, there's really no reason for us to keep complaining to Amazon because it's actually a better scenario if they don't. Yep, Purse.io works perfectly. But uh, at, at Bitcoin Store, we uh, we set out to get Amazon to accept Bitcoin, uh, but we ended up getting Newegg and Tiger Direct to see Bitcoin as a viable uh, payment option, especially for electronics. So it, it worked out in that regard. Um, and uh, I think in our first couple months, we processed over a million dollars and just kind of grew from there on. Uh, a lot of people using Bitcoin at our store to buy whatever electronics that they needed. And it was uh, it was it was a good little ride. So John, we, we've gotten into your background a little bit, and it's it's pretty obvious that you, at a young age, got you know kind of understood the entrepreneurial benefits and opportunities that the internet provides, and then also Bitcoin itself. At like a thirty thousand foot view, as someone who's just natively gotten this, you know, this is something that just seems obvious part of your life since you were fourteen. What's your philosophy on how this uh, has worked out for people so far, and and what the future? brings when using these technologies on a global level in a couple words it's it's going to save us i don't think the corporate jobs that used to exist exist anymore a lot of people are getting angry because there's unemployment and past that people feel like they're just not really contributing anything if they're working in a corporate job they feel like they're a cog and machine that they don't actually you know do anything useful i i think entrepreneurial drive, more small businesses, and people just doing projects for fun more than anything else. It keeps people's interest alive. It keeps people passionate about doing what they're doing. As an aside, it helps people get paid. Uh, and if you're not working a full-time job, going online and finding some freelance work to do is, is something that can basically keep you afloat. It's some interesting advice I've been given. Uh, if you're looking for programmers, the best thing to do is, is find people who are basically working on side projects on GitHub that aren't related to their main job, uh, especially during the workday, because it means that they're bored out of their mind at their main job. <laughs> so the beautiful thing about the internet is it, it just allows flexibility, um, especially if you're using sort of an entrepreneurial vision to uh, chase after what you want to do. For those that have full-time jobs now, one of the big factors in keeping them from you know, diving headfirst into the entrepreneurial space is that fear of going from the known to the unknown. You were kind of forced into it by uh, all, all the normal jobs that teenagers typically hold just saying no to you, so you, you figured out a way. Do you have any insight into uh, how to maybe soften the blow of that of, of coming into the, this world that you're very used to, but um, at one point it was probably quite new to you. I, I think people sort of work themselves up about it, but I, I'm not really in a good position to talk about it because I've always kind of lived in the chaos. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, that's just kind of my default setting at this point. Like, I, I bounce around. That's That's kind of what I do. Everyone has side projects. Everyone has hobbies that they're working on doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what the hobbies are, but th there's something that pa that you have a passion for um, outside of your work. It, if what you want to do, if what you want to do in life is something that you can build up sort of with that time that you have to do, do those side projects and, and that hobby, and if you're willing to work on it when you come home and you're, you're tired from a full day of work and you're, you're still excited to, to do work on it, then uh, you can get started and hopefully see a little bit of success enough to, to push you to, to do it full time. And the, the other side of it too is uh, the sharing economy like Uber and Airbnb are opening up new ways for people to do side jobs to actually make a living, especially if they need to supplement themselves while chasing after a startup that they're creating. Yeah, it seems like a lot of tools have been developed in the last five years that make it easier. You don't have to do it all yourself. You can jump in halfway and then keep going more and more into earning money for yourself on your own terms in something that you prefer doing. It's uh, Interestingly enough, I have a story about that. I was recently in Uber and had 
an odd discussion with the Uber driver, and he was telling me that one of the things that he's, he wants to do is he wants to become a trucker, which apparently you have to pass a bunch of license requirements, a bunch of tests to actually to get a license to actually drive a, a semi-truck. And he was driving Uber basically to support himself, and then every sort of 10-minute break that he would get af- after an Uber ride in between the next ride, he'd pull out a big folder of all of his information about his, his test and study into the car before going to the next Uber client to pick them up and drive them somewhere. It just through the flexibility, he was able to uh, support himself while he was studying to pass the licensing requirements to get his permit to drive a, a semi-truck, which I, I thought was interesting. So as a, an expert in uh, Bitcoin merchant processing and, and companies actually accepting Bitcoin, where do you see the future as far as are there any trajectories or you know what can we expect in one, two, five years? Are any conversations coming up with the different altcoins and different projects out there such as Ethereum and Monero or... Uh, so one thing that we're working on at GoCoin is we're planning on adding Ether acceptance late July, uh, so that's coming up. Uh, we've we've always tried to make sure that we accept all viable currencies uh, for transactions. So we, we accepted Dogecoin when Dogecoin was still a thing. We accept Litecoin. We accept Bitcoin, uh, and we're going to be accepting Ether relatively soon. Um, yeah, GoCoin was the first to accept Litecoin for. Merchant transactions, right? Uh, that is correct, I believe. It was before my time, though, so I'm not 100% confident. Yeah. I, I think I remember that. I don't know. Maybe there's someone else obscure that did it as well, but I, I do remember Steve and the gang announcing that. Yeah. The uh, Google says it's true so much. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it's something that we, we try and keep on, on, on top of. Um, but I, I think... Bitcoin merchant processing is an interesting space right now. Back in 2012, 2013, 2014, everyone expected Bitcoin to sort of blossom and become this huge, exponentially growing thing that everyone in the United States would end up using. Everyone would use it in person with their Bitcoin wallets and online, and there would just be so much volume that we'd eclipse the uh, transactions per second on the Visa network. And that obviously hasn't happened. Um, that was always the comparison was how many tr- transactions can Visa do? Yeah, which in retrospect, a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> but that's that's what everyone was thinking. Now everyone's sort of come to the realization that uh, even the people who own Bitcoin, even the people who advocate for Bitcoin don't necessarily use it to spend their money online. Um, the amount of actual volume that happens on the Bitcoin network that's merchant related is relatively small. And it's always been relatively small. That being said, it is growing. It's just growing at a very slow and linear rate. The things that I think Bitcoin will succeed in are sort of those fringe, risky industries that I've already mentioned before, like gambling, adult, and then possibly other, you know, more uh, unscrupulous things. We're going to be focusing mainly on adult. Uh, we, we've worked with some gambling and gaming merchants in the past, but uh, that's not a main focus for us right now. Do you see more merchants excited to acquire Bitcoin and actually not convert it? In 2013, the price was a lot more volatile. It's seemingly calmed down, although every month or two, uh, some event happens to disprove the volatility is lessening theory, but you, you don't see it too much? Well, so it's actually interesting. I mean, people are still interested in investing in Bitcoin, obviously, but uh, there's not sort of the mania that there was before. Um, there's not sort of the feeding frenzy that the press got into uh, back when the Silk Road was, you know, growing and becoming a, a monolith. It's almost turning into a boring investment at this point, is kind <laughs> of how I would describe it. A safe, boring Which, investment. Yeah. So you, you're aware of the whole Dow collapse that happened uh, basically a week ago, I think, a week and a half ago. Yeah, it makes um, Bitcoin look comparatively stable. I, I had the time of my life watching that happen because it just it reminded me of how Bitcoin felt in the early days. Um, I, I honestly feel like sort of the Wild West is shifting away from Bitcoin and it's going more into these altcoins that are trying to do different things on top of Bitcoin. Um, and that's not limited to Ethereum and Ether. It's, you can also put in a bunch of different companies trying a bunch of different really cool things. And that's where I think you're going to see a lot of the drama and a lot of the press shift to. Um, because Bitcoin at this point, it's it's been up 
it's doing its thing. Everyone knows about it. Everyone knows how it works. Unless something sort of catastrophic happens, I don't think there's going to be really much interest in it. That being said, it's still useful. There's a safe name for it in that can be used in boardrooms called the blockchain. You can just call it the working blockchain, yeah. and, then, and then you're allowed to discuss it in polite company. Well, I mean, yeah, you can only open up a bank account if you say blockchain. If you say Bitcoin, that's still a no-no. Yep, still a naughty word. If you could have a tweet go viral, what would it say? Well, I mean, like, there's the obvious self-serving answer of getting one of the companies I work with in that tweet. Uh, <laughs> at GoCoin. At GoCoin. That's a good question. I, I guess, actually, the thing that I would probably tweet about is... Uh, the fact that there are third parties in this upcoming U.S. presidential election because everyone's feeling constricted to two candidates that, quite frankly, a majority of the American people apparently dislike. So I, that's probably I've the heard, most important thing that I would like to bring to so, the yeah, world's I've, attention. Yeah, I've heard a surprising number of conversations where people are talking like, I don't know who to vote for because I don't feel any confidence in either candidate. And what do I do? There's just no other option. You have to vote. And those are the only two there. And your tweet of your, your tweet can use the hashtag feel the Johnson. <laughs> Which is, look at, is uh, that actually look, his slogan? I don't think that's endorsed <laughs> by him, but I heard that once and thought it was just absolutely awesome. Oh, God. I, I totally see that becoming viral and taking the Internet by storm. My my issue with the Libertarian Party is uh, Gary Johnson. He's he's a fine individual, but he's goofy, how many but... times how many times has he run for president at this point? I have no idea. But multiple, right? I, I believe it's been multiple times. Let me. I'm sure this. I I know that this isn't the first. It's probably not the second either. He got it in 2012. Yep, I remember that. And he, yeah, it was just 2012. Yeah. And then 2016 again. And he barely made any any waves in 2012. So yeah. in this, the most important year for a potential third party to actually come into fruition, we, we get Gary Johnson again, which I don't think he's sort of charismatic enough to compete with sort of the, the populist candidate of Donald Trump. And then you have uh, John, who I always screw up how to pronounce his last name, McAfee. Or is it McAfee? I think it's McAfee, but he's he's not running anymore. He's uh, did think, he drop out? I think the Libertarian Party chose Johnson, and the other guys uh, accepted the decision. So I think they're back. And I think John McAfee is actually now CEO of something called MGT Technologies, publicly traded company, getting into Bitcoin and security. We got Brexit, and then we we have a potential Trump presidency, which means uh, if that happens, I will probably be able to retire on my Bitcoin holdings because they're going <laughs> to just go through the roof. So you're voting Trump, I see. I, I'm also a little bit of an anarchist, so it, it's kind of like a dream come true in a way. Well, John, let's wrap this up so you can get on with your evening. Is there any asks that you have for our audience, anything they should look up, or anything that you've learned recently that you'd highly recommend, and then... Uh, finish up with ways people can get in touch with you or follow your your writings and work. No, I don't. I don't think I have any more any more questions. Um, as always, I uh, I hope more people will spend their Bitcoin at the merchants that already accept Bitcoin. Um, it always helps if we have more people purchasing when they can. Um, past that, if you're interested in accepting Bitcoin as a new merchant, especially if you're in the adult industry, uh, go to GoCoin.com. Uh, if you're interested in credit card processing, you can go to gopaywin.com. Uh, and if you're interested in following my work or any of my writing, you can follow me on Twitter at John underscore HQ. And we'll put that in the show links. John Holmquist, thank you so much for speaking with Liberty Entrepreneurs. Have a great afternoon. All right, you too.